Generators and motor is going to be the topic of this lesson in my new general physics playlist, which when complete will cover a full year of university algebra-based physics. Now in this lesson we're going to talk about generators, which are responsible for the vast majority of the electrical energy on planet Earth. We're going to talk about how they convert mechanical work into electrical energy, and we'll cover the equation for calculating the EMF produced by a generator. And then we'll talk about motors, which are really just generators run in reverse. My name is Chad, and welcome to Chad's Prep where my goal is to take the stress out of learning science. Now, if you're new to the channel, we've got comprehensive playlists for general chemistry, organic chemistry, general physics, and high school chemistry. And on chadsprep.com, you'll find premium master courses for the same that include study guides and a ton of practice. You'll also find comprehensive prep courses for the DAT, the MCAT, and the OAT. So ultimately, a generator is gonna involve a coil of wire rotating in a uniform magnetic field. Uh, you might recall in the last lesson, we said that Faraday's law showed us that if we have a changing magnetic flux, we'll induce an EMF in a loop of wire. And that's what we're gonna be doing here. Now, a reminder that magnetic flux is dependent upon the strength of the magnetic field, the area of the loop, and the angle theta, the angle between the magnetic field and the normal to the plane of the loop of wire. Well, in this case, we're in a uniform magnetic field, so B is not changing. So the area of the loop of the coil is based on the generator design, and it's fixed, it's not gonna be changing. What is changing as this coil rotates, though, is gonna be that angle theta. So that's what we're focusing on here. And ultimately, as this rotates and we get a changing magnetic flux, we'll induce an EMF and we'll get a current to flow through this circuit. So it'll be used to power some sort of device. And ultimately, we'll be converting the mechanical energy it takes to cause the rotation of this coil. Uh, and we'll take that mechanical work and turn it into electrical energy. Now, ultimately, we want to be able to derive an expression for the EMF uh, generated by a generator. And this is that lovely expression here. It depends on the number of turns of wire, the number of loops, if you will, in our coil, the strength of the magnetic field, the area of the coil, and then it's gonna depend on the frequency factor, which is gonna be related to the uh, frequency of rotation, so something we saw back in rotational motion. So, and then also on this uh, sine of omega t, again, that frequency factor one more time, but the big thing is it is sinusoidal in nature. This is not gonna produce a constant EMF, it's gonna be producing an oscillating EMF, so it's gonna be oscillating according to a sine function, hitting a maximum and a minimum that we'll talk about here as well. So in this case, recall that the sine function has a maximum of one and a minimum of negative one. And so the function is gonna have a maximum of NBA omega times one. So and that's this point right here. So that's again, NBA omega. So, and then a minimum down over here of negative NBA omega. So, but it will be oscillating. This is the basis for what we call alternating current or AC circuits. So, and anything you plug into your wall is operating on alternating current. So, and things of a sort, at least the, the electricity coming from walls are alternating current. Now you might have to convert it to direct current if you're powering like a laptop or something like that, where the current's fairly steady. So, but the electricity coming out the wall itself is alternating current and it follows this lovely sinusoidal pattern and is governed by this lovely equation when it's being produced by a generator. All right, so ultimately we want to derive this lovely expression. So, and we could do it very directly from Faraday's law, it turns out. So if we uh, plug in the definition of uh, magnetic flux into Faraday's law, we could derive it. It would just require a little bit of calculus, which we're not using because this is an algebra-based class. So we're gonna come at it from a little bit different angle to derive that. So as this lovely coil of wire is rotating, again, we're getting this changing magnetic flux so we're gonna have some magnetic force on the charges in this lovely conducting wire that's gonna result in a current. And we gotta talk about where are we actually gonna get a current in this wire. So, and it turns out it's not gonna be from the parts of the wire that are parallel to the magnetic field. There's no magnetic force operating on the charges in those parts of the wire. But on these parts that are perpendicular to the magnetic field, there will be uh, a component in that case. And so as this thing is rotating, so in this case we could say the magnetic field is pointing in the direction to the right, and let's say that this thing is rotating like so, then at this point right here it's actually moving into the board. So we'll put our fingers in the direction, again, of the magnetic field, we'll put our thumb into the board in the direction of the velocity, and we'll see that there's going to be a pull on the current in this direction right here. Now, if we do the same lovely exercise on the opposite side over here, so if it's rotating into the board on this side as it goes around, then it's coming out of the board 
So on this side, so again, we'll put our fingers in the direction of the magnetic field, but now we'll have to put our thumb coming out of the board over here. And there's a force up on the charges. And there we go. And again, there's no overall force on these horizontal portions that are parallel with the magnetic field. So, but we don't need them to be. Once there's a pull here and a push here, if you will, there's gonna be a current fl uh, flowing through this lovely circuit. All right, so we also learned in the last lesson that with motional EMF, and that's the approach we can take, we saw that motional EMF we can derive from Faraday's law, and there was a similar expression here of E equals B L V. So where L was the length of the rod that's moving, and in this case, let's just say, instead of actually looking at this as a rotating wire, let's just say we looked at this as a rod we were just pulling out of the board. And as we pulled it out of the board, the EMF that would be generated would be equal to BLV in magnitude. Now the same thing would happen on the other side as it's rotating, instead we'd be pushing it into the board. Well, the problem we have though is that this is rotating. It's not just being pulled straight, it's actually rotating around in a circle. Now right now, when it's moving perpendicular perfectly to the magnetic field, so we get the greatest EMF according to this. But ultimately what we're gonna have to do is just say the only component of the velocity that matters is the component of the velocity that is perpendicular. And so on this side, we're gonna generate an EMF. So due to this lovely part of the loop, that's equal to B, L, V, and the component that's gonna be perpendicular at any point in time is gonna be equal to BLV sine theta. So that's the EMF due to this portion of the coil right here. But on the other side, we're gonna get the same thing. We're gonna get B, L, V, sine theta as well. And so now we can come up with a little bit broader expression for this, and we're gonna need a little room. So the overall EMF then is gonna be the sum of these two, which is just gonna overall double the value. Now there's a couple of substitutions we want to make here. And so again, the length here is just simply the length so of that run of, of cable in the coil. So good to go there, but V here and theta. We've got some substitutions to make. And it's going back to the, the chapter on rotational kinematics we learned earlier. So, but V is equal to R omega and theta is equal to omega T. So if you recall that uh, displacement equals velocity times time. Well, angular displacement equals angular velocity times time. So, and then the relationship between the linear velocity and the angular velocity was multiplying by the radius of the motion. And so in this case, that V right there is gonna equal R omega. So, and I wanna be careful here. Just wanna let you know, I'm gonna do my best to distinguish between omega, where it's got the curly looking W, as omega should, it's really omega, uh, not a curly W. So, and then I'm gonna make a very hard looking W because it turns out my omegas and my Ws look very similar most of the time, but I'm gonna make the width W here look like a very hard looking W. And then the curly looking one is actually omega, the Greek letter, so keep that in mind. Okay, so in this case, uh, the radius of the motion, so it was actually half of the width described here. And so actually, we're gonna substitute that in and instead of R omega, we're gonna have W over two omega. And that's actually, we're gonna substitute in for the velocity right here, and then for theta, omega t. So, and again, V is gonna be W over two times omega, and then sine omega t. So a couple things we can do. One, this two is gonna cancel out this two right here. So we're good to go there. So, and again, this W and this omega are not the same, so we can't get rid of one or the other, but we should realize that now we've got length times width right into the equation. And length times width of this coil, this rectangular coil, that is area. So we can simplify that. And so it's gonna be EMF equals B, and then length times width is area, and then omega sine omega t. Now the expression we've derived here is for a single loop of wire. So as, as kind of depicted in the diagram here, but what if we had two loops? Well, we have to double this value. If we had 10 loops, we have to multiply by 10. And that's where the N comes from. We've got to factor that in in case you've got not just a single turn of wire, but many turns of wire. And that takes that into account. And voila, we've derived our lovely expression for the EMF in a generator, or at least generated by a generator. Which takes us to our first question. So in the first question says, 
What is the maximum EMF resulting from a generator comprised of 100 turns of wire with an area of 0 0.010 meters squared rotating in a 0 0.50 Tesla magnetic field with a frequency of 60.0 Hertz? So we got some fun here, my apologies. So uh, 100 turns of wire, we're given that, we can plug that right in. So magnetic field was given as 0 0.50 Tesla. Area was given as 0 0.010 meters squared, already an SI unit, it's good to go there. So the problem was we weren't given omega, we were given the frequency of rotation of 60 Hertz, which is common in the US, so for the electrical grid. So, and the key is this, is that omega is equal to two pi F. We learned that back uh, uh, a while back in rotational kinematics chapter as well. Used it again, we talked about like springs and pendulums. So, and the key is we've been given the 60 Hertz and we need to use that to get the omega value. And so we'll substitute that in and equal two times pi times that 60.0 hertz. And that's what's gonna get substituted in both here and here, at least sort of. Now the key is this question is just asking for the maximum EMF. And the maximum EMF comes about when the sine function equals one. And so I don't actually have to substitute in there, but that leaves the maximum as just being all this times one. And so the maximum is just really n times b times a times omega. And we'll just plug those values in. So we're told there's 100 turns of wire. Area again was 0.0, oh, skip the magnetic field. Let's get that back. Magnetic field was 0 0.50 Tesla. Area was given as 0 0.010 meters squared. And then omega here is gonna be this two pi times 60 Hertz. In fact, I'm gonna slide that right into place. Two times pi times 60 Hertz. All right, so we're gonna do this calculation in just a second, but one thing to realize, sig figs in this case. So we've got two sig figs in 0 0.50 Tesla, we've got two sig figs in 0.010 meter squared, and we've got three sig figs in 60 Hertz. And so the question is, how many sig figs do we have over here in 100? Well, this isn't like we have about 100 turns of wire. We have exactly 100 turns of wire. And so if you looked at this and said, there's one sig fig, gotta be careful. This isn't like a number that we know approximately. There's exactly 100 turns of wire uh, in our generator coil in this case. So this is an exact number. We can't just look at it and say it's one sig fig. It's exact, it's an infinite number of sig figs. And so it won't actually factor in when we're calculating out the sig figs. So, but these are all numbers that are had to be measured to some degree and are not exact numbers. And that's why we'll round this down to two sig figs based on either one of these. All right, we'll let the calculator do the heavy lifting here. And we've got 100 times 0 0.5 times 0 0.01 times two times pi and times 60, and we're gonna get 188.5 uh, uh, volts in this case, which to two sig figs rounds up to 190 volts. So now we're gonna briefly talk about motors, and uh, no math here, but you really just gotta understand that a motor is essentially a generator run in reverse. So in the case of a generator, we're taking mechanical work and converting it into electrical energy. So the mechanical work is causing this lovely coil to rotate, leading to the creation of a current, i.e. electrical energy. Well, in the case of the motor, it's exactly the opposite. We're gonna start with the current. So we're gonna plug this circuit into some sort of power source here. Complete that circuit. So, and that power source is gonna to lead to a current flowing through this lovely circuit including the coil, so, and that's gonna cause it to spin. So if you recall in the last chapter, we learned about the torque on a current carrying loop. Well, now we have a current carrying loop now that it's plugged into a power source. So, and as a result, there's gonna be a torque on it that's gonna cause it to rotate. So if we kind of looked at uh, force equals ILB sine theta or BIL sine theta, so we could put our fingers in the direction of the magnetic field, our thumb in the direction of the current, and we'd see that there's a force pushing into the board on this side, and then pulling out of the board on this side, it turns out, and that's the torque being generated to cause this thing to wanna to spin. Well, we have one other issue to talk about, and it's what we call back EMF. So in the last chapter, we learned that when you actually have a spinning uh, coil in a magnetic field, 
there's an induced EMF according to Faraday's law. So we were talking about two different EMFs here. So we have an EMF associated with the battery, the power source that the circuit is plugged into. But now we have this back EMF, which is just an induced EMF according to Faraday's law, because it's spinning and experiencing a changing magnetic flux due to that angle changing as well. And so if we actually look at Lenz's law and stuff like this, so that back EMF always opposes the EMF of your power source according to Lenz's law. So, and that's why they call it a back EMF. It's just a, an opposing EMF. And the faster you spin this, the bigger your changing magnetic flux and the bigger this back EMF becomes. So, but that really is all I wanted to discuss when it came to motors. Again, they're just generators run in reverse. They convert electrical energy into mechanical work. If you found this lesson helpful, consider giving it a like. Happy studying.